hybrid trees and modular spaces of stable rational curves. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. It's my first time in Korea, and it's, um, so far it's the country and the conference have been very exciting. So, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to talk about some uh, joint work with Zhenya uh, Tevelev. Sorry. Um, ah. Uh, how do I switch it on? Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so now this thing goes. Um... Okay, so I'd like to talk about some uh, joint work with Jenna Tavelov. And uh, so this will be about the uh, space M0 and bar. And so the mod lie space of stable and pointed rational curves. Okay, so I will denote as usual the interior with M0 N. Yeah, so this is just M distinct points, N pointed P1s uh, up to uh, automorphisms. And so uh, as, as Angela and David were discussing yesterday, the uh, cone of neft divisors and morphisms from the space to other varieties, I'd like to uh, discuss the parallel question of what are the effective divisors on the space. So what is the effective cone of M0 n bar? Or putting it uh, somewhat differently, what are the rational maps from the space to other varieties? And just to fix the notation, um, let me re recall that um, if you have some projective variety over an algebraically closed field, uh, and if you denote by n upper 1x the neuron severity group of, of line bundles, up to numerical equivalence, then the effective cone is defined as the closure in the associated uh, real vector space of the cone generated by effective divisors. So, um, yeah. So when uh, when discussing M0, when discussing a moduli space of, of stable curves, the first divisors, the first effective divisor that you see are the boundary. Yeah. So um, so you have components um, of the boundary corresponding to um, to partitions of the set of markings, which I will always denote with capital M. S is a subset uh, with at most n minus two elements and at least two elements. Yes. So delta S is just as a general element a stable rational curve with two components with markings from S and the complement on the two components. Um, okay, so um, so M zero and bar has uh, several very concrete descriptions as as a blow up. One of which is due to Kapranov, and this identifies M0 M bar with an iterated blow up of a projective space along uh, n minus one general points, points in general position, and subspaces through them.
Okay. Uh, now that this identification depends on a, on, a, on the choice of a marking. Uh, so, namely, if you pick another point, uh, and you can see this birational map by picking another point in Pn minus 3, and then using the fact that through n general points in Pn minus 3, there is a unique rational normal curve passing through them. So, uh, that is the n pointed P1 that will be the pre image of this general point in Pn minus 3. Um, so, so as you can see, this is uh, getting increasingly complicated as n grows. This variety has exponential Picard number. And, um, but also the, the first thing that you see here is that the, the first non-trivial uh, case is for n equal 5 when you have a Delpezzo surface. And in that case, the effective cone is generated by minus 1 curves. So those can be identified with, uh, with the boundary. Yeah, so the effective cone is generated by, for M05, is generated by boundary, which are exactly the minus one curves. Yes, and uh, this might uh, lead to, uh, to somewhat believe that uh, this might be true in general. Uh, so it is not starting with N equals six. Yeah, so Kiel and Vermeer give an example of a divisor on M06 bar that is not a, a sum of boundary. So the effective cone of M06 bar is not generated just by boundary. Yeah, so their divisor is uh, obtained as follows. So if you consider the map from M06 bar to M3 bar, given by identifying pairs of markings on a stable six-pointed curve. So if I identify one with two, three with four, and five with six, I get the curve in the boundary of M3 bar. And if I, um, if I pull back now the hyperelliptic locus in M3, which is an extremal divisor on M3 bar, And this is a divisor that, um, that not only is not the sum of, of boundary, it is in fact uh, an extremal divisor. And so you get an ex a divisor that intersects the interior and is an extremal divisor. Yeah, so this, in, if you want to think of the Kaplanov model, this is a quadric, a rigid quadric. Um, uh, on this iterated blob of P3, and uh, you can also cover it with curves that intersect it negatively, just as you do for the boundary. And so, and so this gives you an extra extreme array. And of course, you can cho make different choices for the identification of the points. Um, but then further, uh, Hassett and Schinkel proved that in fact these are all the extreme arrays. So the effective cone of M06 bar is generated by boundary and these divisors, which I will call Kilvermeer divisors. Yes, and so uh, I should say that, um, so M06 bar is not Fano, but it is log Fano. So, uh, the fact that the cone is polyhedral uh, was known, uh, and now it's known by BCHM that um, that, the, uh, that any log Fano is a more dream space. So, in particular, the effective cone is is polyhedral. However, you don't uh, you don't know generators, and um, so I would like uh, and also for so for higher n m zero n is not a log Fano. So, starting with n equal eight, the anti-canonical class is not effective. Okay, and um, and also I should say that uh, that this Kilbermeer divisor uh, gives you also uh, examples of divisors on the interior of M0n that are not sums of boundary for higher n. Yeah, so uh, if you consider forgetful maps, yeah, so if you take a subset i and n and consider the corresponding forgetful map from M0n bar to M0i, 
then pulling back um, the kill Vermeer divisor gives you extreme arrays in the effective cone of M0 n bar for any n greater than 6. Okay, so. And uh, one more one more result that I uh, that I'd like to mention that shows uh, that shows where the complexity comes from uh, is the is the result of Keel and McKernan, which says that the effective cone of M zero n tilde, yeah, so M zero n bar, quotient out by the action of the symmetric group, is in fact a polyhedral cone generated by boundary. So for divisors, this is a much simpler cone for effective divisors. Um, okay, so so I'd like to I'd like to uh, to make a conjecture about the effective cone of M zero M bar, and so. The claim is that what you have to add here is, uh, is certain divisors that correspond to some combinatorial data that I will define next. So the effective cone of M0M bar is generated by, by boundary and together with some divisors which I will call uh, hypertree divisors. And I would like to consider this uh, on all subsets of the set of markings. So I'd like to explain this now. Okay. Okay, so. So let me make a definition. And so I will, I will call a hypertree on a subset M of markings uh, to be a collection of subsets of the set of markings. with the following property. So first, uh, I'd like every subset to have at least three elements. I'd like the number of, uh, so for any marking, I'd like the number of uh, subsets that contain it to be at least two. And then two axioms that Let's say something about the uh, cardinality of the subset. So one axiom which I call the normalization, which is the fact that the sum of the cardinality of gamma alpha minus 2 for all alpha is equal to n minus 2. And finally, one that I call convexity, which is that for any uh, subset of 1 through d, non-empty, when you look at the union of the gamma alphas for alpha in S, this cardinality minus 2 is at least um, the sum just as before for alpha in S. Okay, so, so let me give an example. So when these sets have a, are of cardinality 2, then these are just edges of a tree. 
Um, no, no. Um, so yeah, so the f so the most common example of a hypertree would be when all the gamma alphas are three. But if you require that the that the gamma alphas are two, then uh, and you replace this two here by by one, then this is exactly equivalent to being a tree. So this, this sets gamma alpha. Yes. Just yes. Yes, and so for triples, this just says that you have n minus two triples, and the union of any m of them has covers at least n plus two of the of the markings. So my main example is for n equals six. Yeah, so the you can read off the hypertree from. Uh, from the following lines in, um, that I label the intersections 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And I want to read off the markings that are collinear. So 1, 2, 3, 1, 4, 5, 2, 4, 6, and 3, 5, 6. I claim this satisfies these conditions. Okay, further, I would like to call uh, hypertree to be irreducible. If the convexity inequality is strict whenever uh, S is not the full set 1 through B when you have equality by, by the normalization axiom or when uh, S is a singleton. Which again you have equality. Okay, so again you can check that this is true for my example. And now you can attempt to uh, classify uh, such irreducible hypertrees. And so for n equals 6, it's easy to see that uh, up to labeling, this is a unique, uh, there is a unique irreducible hypertree up to the labeling of the intersections of the lines. For n equals 7, again, it's easy to see that, that there is just one uh, hypertree, again, up to labeling of the intersections. For n equal 8, there will be three irreducible hypertrees, one of which um, will not consist just of triples. For n equal 8, you have three of them. And then the numbers grow rapidly. Uh, so we have a classification for and 9 and 10. Yeah, so here you have uh, 9. For n equal 10, you have about 90. And for n, also for n equal 11, you have 1,000. Again, up to labeling. Um, so for these small cases, uh, for small n, uh, you can obtain all of them in, in this way by looking at a configuration of lines in the plane. Yes? First, is there an intuitive uh, explanation for this convexity, what, what it means, just the intuitive way of thinking about it? Yeah, so it means that, uh, it means exactly, yeah, so this is equivalent up to, up to these conditions. Yeah, this is, um, you can relax this one, but it's essentially equivalent to the fact that uh, um, that the product of forgetful maps from M0, N plus 1 to the product of and zero gamma alpha union n plus one. And so for alpha in S, that this is dominant. And this this is easy to see from the Caprano description of the space. And so again, the Caprano description is the description of the iterated blow up when you choose a marking. You know, I have a common marking that in all these spaces n plus one. Let's choose that one as our special marking and look at the yes. Yeah, so this is now a product of projections from subspaces spent by the points that I forget. And is a general type of tree somehow the union of its irreducible components? Um, so for uh, if I uh, so for reducible hypertrees, uh, yes, for a reducible hypertree I can find a subset in the set of markings such that. Um, uh, such that I can obtain this hypertree from that one, from an irreducible hypertree on a smaller subset of markings. So 
the normalization is just magical dimensions, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. So this is exactly that the dimensions are the same. Okay. All right. So. So back to just, I want to say one more thing about the classification here. So again, uh, for the hypertrees, the reducible hypertrees that we can classify, uh, you can see directly from there that they are all coming from these uh, lines in the plane and reading off uh, collinear points. So this will be, in fact, a feature of, of uh, irreducible hypertrees always. Um, and uh, so we don't know how to classify reducible hypertrees for any n, but we know how to generate many of them. So I will say more about that later. Okay, so so I'd like now to, how to, to explain how to get a divisor, an extremal divisor from every reducible hypertree. So, so I, would, I will define a planar realization of gamma to be a configuration of points in the plane with collinearity prescribed by the hypertree. Yeah, so it's a, a configuration of points. P1 through Pn in P2, such that points of Pi for I and capital I are collinear if and only if I is a subset of one of the gamma alphas. Okay, uh, and then I'd like to define a, a locus in M0M bar which will be our hypertree divisor, although for now it will not be clear at all that it is a divisor. So the hypertree divisor d gamma is by definition the closure in M0 n bar of the locus in the interior obtained by looking at all the planar realizations and projecting from points, general points in the plane. So let me um, go to my example. Yeah, so there is just one way to put this, this um, uh, hypertree in the plane. And now I'd like to project from general points. And this way you get a six-pointed P1. So project So this is, you get a surface in M06 this way, and I want to close this up, and this is the hypertree divisor associated to gamma. Yeah, so in general, I just want to take all the possible planar realizations and project from general points in P2. Yeah, so a priori, it's not clear, again, that this is, uh, is non-empty or that it is a divisor. So again, about the example for n equals 6, I claim that, in fact, what we have in this picture um, that I have there, this divisor d gamma is, in fact, the Kilvermeer divisor corresponding to identifying pairs 1, 6, 2, 5, and 3, 4. So this comes from um, a more concrete description of of the Kilvermeer divisor. Yeah, so this was the, the pullback of uh, the hyperelliptic locus in M3. What this means is what this means for our three nodal curves obtained from rational by obtained by identifying pairs of points means exactly that you have a three nodal curve which has a degree two map to P1. 
So looking at the normalization of this curve, uh, this means exactly that you're looking at, um, at the locus of six-pointed P1s for which when you embed this P1 as a conic, the, these pairs of lines will intersect. Yes, I want to say the Kilvermeer divisor, one, six, two, five, three, four, will contain uh, the six-pointed P1, um, P1, P6 on P1, if and only if the uh, lines corresponding to my pairs intersect when you consider this P1 as a conic in P2. We are the Baroness in Bank. Yeah, so. yeah, so this is clearly a divisor in, uh, in a, a divisor worth of such points. Okay, uh, so now it's the, the statement that I made here is just a, a statement that on, a, on the interior, the, the six-pointed P1s for which this happens is the same as the six-pointed P1s that you get by projecting uh, this figure uh, from points in the plane. And this is a, an exercise in um, Cremona transformations. And but if you write it, it's obvious that this is the this is obvious. condition that uh, the curve and yes. The yes. The yes. This is obvious. Yeah. Here you have to do a bit of work. Yeah, this is the uh, and uh, so here it was actually pointed out to us by Dolgachev that this, that the two loss are the, the fact that the two loss are the same in N06 has been known, uh, and it appears uh, in a paper of Joubert from 1867. So, okay. So this, yes. Once again, so to this device, you choose various uh, planarizations of all of them. Of yes. All of them. Yes. 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 And I only want to project from general points because I would like to have uh, n distinct points on P1. This you have at least one uh, So this is the theorem. Okay. So. So the theorem is that if you have gamma an irreducible hypertree, then first gamma has a planar realization. And second, D gamma is in fact a, a divisor, and in fact it is an irreducible divisor that is also extremo. So it generates an extreme array of the effective cone. And I should also say that, so in the conjecture that I put before, I would like to take all the subsets of the set of markings, look at all the irreducible subtrees, uh, hypertrees on those, uh, pull them back by forgetful maps if necessary, and uh, so those are the hypertree divisors that I, I want to consider. Okay. Um, so I'd like to discuss the idea of the proof. So the idea is to, to use uh, Brillnutter theory for some reducible curves that you associate to these hypertrees. And so uh, the divisor condition comes from the fact that, so a general n-pointed P1 
uh, will not have a planar realization, but whenever you have planar realization, this is a special locus in M0N bar that, that is in fact a divisor, and I'm claiming it's a very special divisor. Okay, so, um, so first I'd like to make a, a, an analogy. So, so, yeah, so when you look at um, a smooth genus G curve, and I'll also assume it is a general uh, curve. Uh, then if I look at the Brillnotter locus, WR G plus one of line bundles of degree G plus one that have at least uh, an R plus one dimensional space of sections, and it's easy to see by Riemann Roch that uh, W1 G plus one is, is exactly the whole Picard variety of Lyman's degree G plus one. And uh, the Brillnotter theorem says that, um, so because the curve is general, these spaces are irreducible and have co-dimension R squared minus one. So if I denote now further G1, G plus one to be the, the locus of line bundles of degree G plus one together with the pencil, Okay, so uh, I have a forgetful map to the Picard variety, which I want to call pi. And yeah, so it is immediate that this map is, um, is a birational map whose exceptional locus consists uh, exactly of the pre-image of the locus W2. Yeah, so this is a forgetful map. And so it's, uh, this is an isomorphism outside, outside W2. Yes, and, uh, and any component of the pre-image will be an exceptional divisor for, uh, for this map, which is a map between two smooth projective varieties, so any component will be, an, will be a divisor that generates an extreme array of the effective cone. The effective cone of G1, G plus one. Um, uh, okay. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, so the, this is the exceptional divisor, yeah, so this generates an extreme array. Okay. Uh, so this is the, uh, so I wanna use a similar idea, except um, I will not have a smooth curve and um, things will get a bit more complicated because I cannot identify M0N bar with uh, such a brill locus. But I will do it on the interior. So M0N will be identified with a brill locus um, of a reducible curve that I associate to the, to the hypertree. Okay, so. So to every hypertree gamma, I can associate a reducible curve as follows. So I want to take um, as many components as subsets. So I will have D components, each is a P1 
and I want to label it with markings from the corresponding set. And I'd like to glue at the, at the common markings. And I glue uh, such that uh, locally at every, every marking, this is a, looks like the union of axes in affine space. And so from the axiom that uh, every marking is containing at least two such subsets, uh, then I know that the singular locus of such a curve is precisely the set of markings. So I have a singular a reducible curve with labeled singularities, and it's easy to, so again, I'm, since I have at least, from my first axiom, I have at least three, three marking on, markings on every component, I can fix three of those to be, um, to be zero, one, and infinity, and so, um, so the, as a as a labeled uh, curve, this has no non these curves have no non-trivial automorphisms. Yeah, in the most common case, when these are triples, you have just one such curve. In general, there are uh, moduli, so these are given exactly by the by the cross ratios of the points on each component. So I want to call m gamma this moduli space, which is exactly the product of m zero gamma alphas. So the interior of M0 gamma alpha. Okay. And so, uh, um, so I'm after um, plane realizations of these curves. So I'd like to understand the line bundles that would that would make a, such a hypertree curve map to uh, to P2 in such a way that every every component maps to a line. So, so I'd like to look at the relative Picard scheme. Which I will call peak uh, one underline. And so this is um, relative over M gamma and it parameterizes hypertree curves of type gamma together with a line bundle such that uh, on every component this is, uh, has degree one. And so the fibers here are just uh, g-dimensional tori where g is the genus of, of such a curve. And so g is the genus of, of this curve which is and minus three minus the dimension of M gamma. So this is, uh, in fact, a trivial GMG torsor. Okay, and now I'd like to understand those line bundles that uh, that have maps to P two. So more generally, I can I can consider line bundles that map to uh, a projective space of dimension at least R. So let me define Brunner loci for these curves. So I want to call GR the scheme parameterizing hypertree curves of type gamma together with the line bundle and the pencil. So the line bundle I'd like to be, okay, so sigma L is an element in peak one. Okay, the line bundle has at least um, an R plus one dimensional space of sections. And then V is a pencil which is uh, base point free and separates singular curves, singular <laughs> points. So, okay, so I get any, uh, so if I'm after plane realizations that I would get any of them by looking at a G2 and uh, picking such, and then I get the endpointed P1s by picking, a, um, picking points to project from. Yes. Okay, so this is again a um, 
relative over m gamma. And uh, so the key observation for this proof is that is that n zero n the interior can be identified with um, with the space G one. So the, let me say this again here. So um, yeah, whenever I have an element of G1, that is exactly this data of a pencil that is base point three. So I have a morphism to P1 that, separ that sends the singular points to different points. And so I can just take the image, and that is an endpointed P1. And so vice versa, if you take endpoints on P1, you can define a unique morphism that sends the markings to those points by looking component by component. Yeah, so there is a unique map component by component that maps the markings to to my um, endpointed P1s in the prescribed way. Okay, so, yeah, so maybe let me run this. So for any endpointed P1, there is a unique map from sigma to P1 such that f of i is qi. And then, um, yeah, so then the map that will play the map of the, the role of the map g1 to w1 before is the map from m0n identified with g1 and consider the map to, to pick one. Yeah, so this is the analog. of the map G1, G plus 1, pick G plus 1 of C in the case when C is a smooth curve. And uh, so as I said, so the, some of the key points in the proof are that uh, the condition that gamma is a hypertree is precisely the condition that, that this product of forgetful maps from n0 n plus 1 to the product of m0 gamma alpha union n plus 1 is uh, a birational map. The reducibility comes into play as follows. So gamma irreducible implies that, that the difference in Picard numbers between these spaces, so I have a birational map between m0 n plus 1 and this product given by m0 gamma alpha union n plus 1. So this is just a, uh, okay, so let me finish. Um, so this is exactly one plus the number of boundary components contracted by, by this map. So, um, so I have a birational map between smooth projective varieties, and the difference in Picard numbers is exactly this. So this, this tells you that there is just one irreducible divisor in the exceptional locus that, uh, that intersects the interior. And the irreducibility is used to understand how the boundary behaves via this map. And yeah, I, f I find this one a sort of a miracle that it, that it, this combinatorial condition, this extra combinatorial conditions guarantees that. Um, okay. So, so I'd like to go further and describe a, a birational contraction that that contracts this divisor. And so this will come from exactly this map that I have here. And so I have a compactification. I have M0N bar here. And I just want to give a compactification for, uh, for peak 1 that will be a rational map, a birational map that is a birational contraction that contracts on the interior just the divisor D gamma. So, so for this, let me say that, yeah, so Obviously, the curve sigma that I'm considering, these hypertree curves, are not stable curves, are not nodal curves. But I can consider a stable model just by inserting a P1 at every point where, where you have more than three components 
where I'd have at least three components uh, meeting. And I would like to do this in a uniform way for all the hypertree curves. Yeah, so whenever you have, say, at least at least four components meeting at a point, I'd like to fix a cross ratio and insert a P1, therefore, with exactly the, that cross ratio for those points. So, yeah, so I want to just, uh, whenever I have something like this in the hypertree, then I want to insert a P1 and fix the cross ratio of these points and attach, well, the, the components of the hypertree curve. Yeah, so this is sigma s, this is sigma. And so you can do this um, over the moduli space of hypertree curves. And in fact, you can do it over uh, a compactification of the moduli space, which is just the natural compactification, the product of M0 gamma alpha, 0 gamma alpha bar. Yeah, so I claim nothing changes when you consider, in fact, a, um, a boundary point in the space. You still have a hypertree curve, you just will have more components. And so this is now, I can consider similarly a family of stable models. Okay. And so I'd like to define x gamma to be the, the normalization of the closure of peak one, of the relative peak one. So here peak one, uh, well, it's the, it's the same as before, except, uh, yes, I want to consider it on this family. So that means I'm looking at line bundles uh, on, the, the semi, on the stable models that, um, um, that have degree one on the components coming from the, from the components of the hypertree curve and uh, degree zero on the other ones. So the closure of peak one in, in the relative compactified Jacobian for this family. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, so the theorem is that, that again, if gamma is an irreducible hypertree, then the birational map V from M0 n bar to this x gamma is a birational contraction, meaning that uh, the inverse contracts no, no divisors. Such that uh, d gamma is a unique component of the exceptional locus that intersects the interior. Okay. And so yeah, this, is, um, this is a bit of evidence for, um, for a hypothetical decomposition of the effective cone into uh, cones corresponding to birational contractions. Yeah, so, I, I think of it as a small step towards M0 bar being a more dream space. Um, yeah. It's a very small step, but <laughs> yes? No. Okay, so the theorem is based again on, a, uh, on an analysis of, of the contracted divisors. Uh, we know exactly how this behaves on the interior. And it's uh, using um, work of Oda Seshadri, Alexeev, and Caporazo about 
the description of the boundary of this uh, of this x gamma. Okay, so I'd like now to to go into um, just giving constructing many reducible hypertrees. And uh, so, so these come. Uh, there are at least two ways to construct many reducible hypertrees. One of which is is given by the following. So if you consider K to be a bicolored triangulation of a sphere, yeah. So this is on M vertices. And if you denote uh, gamma to be the collection of black triangles, and gamma prime to be the collection of white triangles, then, yeah, so these will be now subsets of triples of the set of one through m. And so gamma, gamma prime will be, in fact, hypertrees. Uh, you can say precisely when such a hypertree is reducible. So this is if and only if this triangulation is not a connected sum of two triangulations. And uh, surprisingly, yes, you, so you, you do in fact get uh, the same divisor. So, so far, yes, you might think that uh, all these irreducible Hypertrees will give you different divisors, but in fact they don't. And uh, uh, however, I, I would like to say that I would like to show that it, in fact uh, you have enough of them, uh, even modulo this this fact. Uh, so, for example, for n equals six, it's easy to see that the hypertree that I uh, that you have for n equals six is a, such a is coming from such a triangulation. And so I'll call these hypertrees. Uh, coming from triangulation spherical hypertrees. And so for n equals 6, this is easy to see. Yeah, so these are the. Okay, this is my hypertree. Um, okay. Yeah, so let me first show you that there, there could be bigger problems than just uh, having these black and white uh, hypertrees giving you the same divisors. So you can have an example of a hypertree where more, um, you can have a spherical hypertree for which more than just these two are equal. Yeah, so you can look at the bipyramid. Yeah, so. Okay, so let me call this one, two, and then label the points along the equator, three, four, five, up to two K plus two. Okay. Okay, so again, I want to look at gamma, the collection of black triangles of this hypertree. And you can look at now at the map, M0, two K plus two, mapping to the moduli space of genus 2k minus 1 curves. Yeah, this is again a map that, uh, that takes a 2k plus 2 point to the rational curve and associates to it a genus 2k minus 1 curve, but not in, um, obviously not in, uh, by identifying pairs of points, but rather identifying 1 and 2. And then at the, you have 2k tuples corresponding to the odd numbered points and the even number points. And so it's like k points, k, and I want to identify one and two. And at these k top, at this two k tuples, I want to insert the p1. And so this is um, okay. So it will not matter what is the cross ratio of the points on p1 that I consider. And then the claim is that d gamma is in fact the closure of of the Brillnutter divisor on M2K minus one. 
Yeah, so I, I take the pre-image of the Brillouin neutral locus to, to the interior of M0 to M0 to k plus 2 and close up in M0 to k plus 2 bar. Here E is the locus of curves with, with the G1k. So, yeah, these divisors arise in this way, just like I um, mean, the Kilber mirror divisor is just the first case of this. Uh, but um, um, that is correct. Yes, you're right. Sorry, you're right. Uh, the proof, however, is the same. Uh, so. The way you prove this is identical to, to that proof. I'm sorry. Uh, right, yes. OK. True. OK. All right. So in fact, what this shows is that, uh, is that this D gamma is, in fact, an effective divisor on the quotient coming from the quotient by the action of the product of symmetric groups S2, SK, and SK. So you can permute anyway like these K points and these K points and 1 and 2. And the, all these hypertrees will give you the same divisor. OK. Uh, but nevertheless, as I said, I want to say that uh, you can impose more conditions on the hypertree. In this case, you do know the classes, right? From the um, no, I don't. Because uh, what happens here is that uh, when you just pull pull back using the usual rules, at least in the first case when I uh, okay, let me yeah. So what what happens? Uh, you have boundary contained in this pre-image, and so yes, and it can appear with multiplicity. And this computation is pretty involved. It's actually easier to to um, to understand the divisor that you get on the interior. So let me let me maybe say also that um, that there is an extra condition that we impose, which is a technical condition on. Uh, so if if you have an irreducible hypertree that is also generic, which. I will not define right now, but what it means is that it tells you that if you identify, if you look at the image of certain boundary components via the forgetful map given by the gamma alphas, that that map has maximum uh, possible um, image. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So then, yeah. So then, if you have such a hypertree, then if there is some other hypertree such that d gamma is the same as d gamma prime, then in fact gamma and gamma prime are spherical hypertrees. With gamma the collection of black triangles And gamma prime, the collection of white triangles. And now th there are all inductive ways to construct uh, irreducible generic hypertrees that are not spherical. And so, so it's only these ones that uh, that give you a lower bound on, on the number of extreme arrays. But as I said, the number is still high. Um, once again, <laughs> sorry. Uh, let me just uh, say what Gavi was asking before. Yeah? So there are examples. So when you consider the map that identifies pairs of points, uh, in all the examples that we looked at, we put back extremal divisors on mg bar. Um, we get moving divisors on m0n bar that way. Even when you just look at the proper transform. Yeah? So you take the pre-image here and close up. You get a moving divisor at the pre-image of extremal divisors. Yeah? So we check this for the Brillouin divisor for m5. Um, or the Weierstrass divisor for M31 pulled back to M07. In this case, it seems to be the opposite. In this case, it's the opposite. But the map is different. Uh, yes. 
But you are putting back the easy answer. Um, well, I th something that contains an exception. So you get, right. Um, right, so the brilliant divisor is, uh, is, uh, is big starting with, with k equal 5 or k equal 6. You, you told me this. 7, OK. Um, right. Yes, but OK, what I want to say is that when you pull back the brilliant divisor from M5 by the, the map that identifies pairs of points, yeah, so if you look at N0, 10, mapping to M5 by the map that, okay, so the map that identifies pairs of points, then when you take uh, the closure of this Brillnotter divisor, this is in fact moving. And the same thing happens when you do uh, M07 to M31, and you pull back. E is either the Weierstrass divisor, so a pair of a curve, a curve with the Weierstrass point, or um, the bitangent locus. Yeah, so the pair of um, so a point on a genus three curve such that. There is another point such that these two points are um, on a bitangent with respect to the canonical embedding. So in all these cases, uh, when you pull back these extremal divisors uh, and close up, you get the moving divisor. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Uh, just visibly, so we compute the class, and uh, we use Macaulay actually to compute the class. And um, you can see from the class that you can write it as a sum of boundary. Just this boundary. But this is uh, going to be an uh, this is an irreducible divisor that intersects the interior. However, it's also linear equivalent to, visibly to a sum of boundary. So I'd like to stop here. One more yes. No, no, no. In fact, uh, it is not true because uh, gen the generic non-spherical ones cannot be equal to anything else. While if you the ones that are pullbacks have some symmetry. Well, okay. yes, no. 